Our scripture reading this morning comes from James chapter 5, verses 12 through 20. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has greater power as it, it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of his sins. Will you pray with me? Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit desires to speak to each one of us all the time. And one of the main ways that you speak with us is through your Holy Scriptures. So we ask this morning that you would speak. Thank you that we have your word, that we can read it for ourselves and hear you speak to us. We pray, Lord, that we would become more aware of just how willing you are to heal, to see your power work through us to help others around us. Thank you for what you're going to do this morning. And we thank you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. My friends, if you haven't already, if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open up to James chapter 5. If you would like an actual physical Bible, there are some in the seat backs in front of you. You can find James chapter 5 in this passage on page 1013. So feel free to grab one of those, or if you prefer a phone, if you prefer a tablet, any kind of device, I want to encourage you to open up to James chapter 5. So we have been going through the book of James for 13 weeks now. And we've come to the very last passage in the entire book. It's also the last passage in this series we've been doing called When Battling Monsters. Because we've been saying when battling monsters of temptation that God is showing us in the end of James, when battling monsters of different temptations, there's a danger of becoming a monster ourselves by standing against them. And we don't want to see that happening. And so this is continuing in that theme. And we're going to see that. But as I turn to James 5... What I see reminds me of a time when I lived in a little town called Grand Island, Nebraska. Now, has anyone heard of Grand Island, Nebraska? Well, all right, I'm surprised. I'm going to show you on a map where Grand Island, Nebraska is. So you can see there right in the heart of Nebraska, right in the heart of the country. And some of you are going, huh, that looks like a weird place for an island. Let me tell you, the founders of Grand Island were a little liberal with their usage of the word grand and with their usage of the word island. <laughs> but it's this little town in Nebraska, and surprisingly, there's a, there's a large population of people from all different parts of the world. Because for a variety of reasons, refugees since the Vietnam War have been finding their way out there. So you've got all these different communities from around the world, and in my time out there, I had the honor of working with a congregation of refugees from Sudan. 
This was when the Civil War had been raging in Sudan. So these people who were committed Christians had been driven from their homes in the Nuba Mountains, and they'd somehow ended up in Grand Island, Nebraska. And I've thought of them often while reading the book of James, because the first churches that would have read the book of James would have been very similar to this congregation of Sudanese refugees. Many people driven from their homes, many people trying to find a way to make ends meet, trying to find a way to earn money even outside of their fields, outside of what they had always done. I asked one of these refugees one time because I knew many of them had come through Houston or Omaha, Nebraska. I said, why are you here? Like even the people in Nebraska don't usually wanna stay in Nebraska, why are you here? And he said, you know, back home we were farmers. And our parents were farmers and our grandparents were farmers. And he said, we don't want to live in cities. We don't want our kids to grow up in cities. We want to be in small towns. And many of them even wanted to be farmers, but they were working graveyard shifts at meat packing plants just to try to make ends meet for their family. And that's similar to the first readers of James. And so as we come to this final passage in the book of James, I found myself wondering, if God sent a letter specifically to that little Sudanese congregation in Grand Island, Nebraska, what would be the last thing he would say to them? What would be his closing words in that letter? And I think his closing words might be the same closing words we find here in the book of James. So let's dive into these final words and see why that would be. See, we end on verse 12. And it says, but above all my brothers, and that above all is going to encompass everything that's to come. He's saying, I've said all of this to you in the first four and a half chapters, five and a half chapters, but above all, here are the biggest things to take away from that. Above all, and then this is not what we would think would qualify as an above all. He says, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be your yes and your no be your no, so you may not fall under condemnation. It seems a little odd that he would be that against oaths. It's helpful here to remember that James was the half-brother of Jesus. And in Jesus' life, when he was arrested and when he was being put through kangaroo courts, this theme of oaths came up before. See, if you were to turn to Matthew 26, 73 through 74, it'll be on the screen behind me, you'd read this about when Jesus' closest disciple, Simon Peter, was coming after him as Jesus was arrested. And it says, after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, one of these followers of this man who's just been arrested by the government as a possible rebel who may get executed. Certainly you're one of them. Your accent betrays you. You're from the same place. And then Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. The Greek word there specifically means to swear an oath. Peter swears an oath. I do not know the man. And so when James is saying, do not swear oaths, this isn't just a general, don't go into the courtroom and swear an oath to tell the truth. See, in his day, swearing an oath could be a convenient way to hide one's allegiance to Jesus under convoluted words. Swearing an oath could be a way to hide one's allegiance to Jesus under convoluted words. It could be a way of not sharing directly, where are you at? Let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Are you a follower of this Jesus? Yes or no? Are you committed to living in his way? Yes or no? And what an oath could be is a way to hide it, a way to bury it, a way to not let it be shown so that there was no suffering that would come from being a faithful follower of Jesus. And what God is saying here is don't give in to that. Because what we know is this, when we get in the habit of hiding our faith under convoluted words, it becomes very easy to start hiding your faith in convoluted actions until your faith itself becomes convoluted. And so God says, don't give in to that temptation, but it's hard not to. It's hard not to do that. Because to just be that blunt yes, to just be that blunt no, can bring persecution, can bring suffering, can bring all kinds of bad stuff that we frankly don't want to have brought on us. And so God gives us what to do to be able to 
to sustain ourselves, to be able to stay strong in those times. And this is where it becomes so important for us to hear. Because we not, might not be in the same place as those first readers of James. We might not be in the same place as that first Sudanese congregation. But any of you in here who say, I am committed to Jesus and I want to follow him, know in some form or the other the temptation to bury that allegiance because of the worry of the repercussions it can bring. And so God says the way you don't give in to that is this, verse 13. First it says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now that word suffering is important because there's lots of things that can cause us to suffer. But this word particularly means suffering because of the treatment you receive at the hands of wicked people. It's used two times in the New Testament. One of those places is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, where it says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. And we see there that the suffering is not just the suffering of being physically ill. The suffering is not just the ups and downs that come with life. This suffering is particularly somebody has chosen not to bury their faith, but to live it out. And they're being treated in an evil way by others because of it. It's similar in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, where it says, As for you, speaking to Timothy, who's going to be leading this church, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. And you can see in that context, the suffering is considered part of the ministry because the expectation is Timothy is not going to bury his faith or the, the way that we may be most tempted to do it. Timothy is not going to soften the rough edges of following Jesus that are unpopular in his day and age. Timothy is not going to water it down. He's not going to make it gentler. He's not going to make it more palpable. And because of that, there may be wicked treatment by people. And so in James 5.13, when God said, is anyone among you suffering? Saying specifically, have you chosen to be true to walking with Jesus? And if so, are you suffering because of that? Are you suffering financially? Are you being turned out by family members? Have the invitations that were coming before suddenly dried up? All of a sudden, have you been blackballed at your job? Did you just hit a ceiling and you will go no higher because you were true to your faith? If that's happening, he says, let him pray. Now that doesn't exactly seem like rocket science, especially in a church setting, something's going wrong. Let him pray. But the idea here, the, the answer to the why pray is because it's the idea that in prayer, God is going to minister to you in such a way that it's going to strengthen you to be able to continue. As an example of that, Martin Luther King Jr. records a moment early in his involvement with the civil rights movement in the South, when the pressure on him was starting to really heat up. The hatred was really starting to amp up on him. And it was common for him to start receiving 40-some phone calls a day of people threatening him if he didn't back down from his work for racial justice. But there was one night that one of the phone calls really shook him. His wife and a young daughter were upstairs sleeping. And he got a phone call. And the short version is the person said, you have three days to get out of your house or we are blowing it up. And King put the phone down and he said he was trembling. He was just utterly shaken by this. It was the first time he was at a point where he was going, should I keep going with this or do I need to throw in the towel? And he said he got out just a, a short, basic prayer, nothing deep, nothing you know, immensely theological, but just the cry of somebody suffering at the hands of evil people calling out to God. And he said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right, but I must confess I'm losing my courage. But he said, sitting there at this dining room table in the dark of night, he heard God speak in an inner voice saying to him, Martin Luther, stand up for truth, stand up for justice, stand up for righteousness. And in those words, King found the strength to do that. The, the trembling stopped. He found the strength to endure the suffering. And his house was bombed days later. And yet he still had the strength to continue even in the midst of that wicked treatment by wicked people. And he found it by going to God in prayer. And with far less dramatic stories, I can vouch from that in my own life. 
from being in the midst of wicked people who weren't threatening me physically, who I found out later were acting intentionally deceptive, who were withholding information that in any kind of integrity would have been shared in order to lead me to the places they wanted, in places that would have been destructive, in places that would have abounded in sin. And I remember my own night sitting under a, at a kitchen table, dark of the night, crying out to God and hearing God speak internally in a way that gave me the strength to say, this is going to be hard, this is going to be unpleasant, but I am going to need to make this choice because it's the right one to do, even though it's going to bring consequences with it. And so what God is telling you here is if you are suffering, maybe now, maybe in the future, go to prayer because through that he will minister to you what you need to be able to stay strong and stay true through that suffering. Now he says that for anyone who's suffering, but then it, it turns the corner in the second half of the verse because it goes from suffering, which is heavy, to is anyone cheerful? That's a much more pleasant topic to talk about. And this word cheerful, it carries the picture, though, not just of somebody who's being happy. It's not the kind of cheerful that says, the Broncos won, and I have some good food in the oven, and I'm feeling good on Monday. It's the kind of cheerful that speaks specifically of being encouraged by God. Are you encouraged by God? Has God shown up in such a way that you are encouraged, that you're lifted up by it? And then he gives what, for some of you, like my wife, is natural because you're going to do it anyway, and for others of you is incredibly challenging. He says, let him sing praise. Now, why does he do that? Why does he say if you're excited like that, if you're cheerful, why does he say let him sing praise? Two reasons. The first is because it's the natural response to when God encourages a person. See, if you were to read through the entire Bible, what you'd find is there's one book called Psalms, which is basically a book of songs. But then there's a whole bunch of songs in other parts of the Bible. There's a song when the people of Israel are led out of slavery in Egypt. There's a song when a woman who was barren prays to God and conceives. There's a song when angels visit people and tell them, you're going to have a child and you're going to have a child and he's going to be Jesus and he's going to be a prophet who goes before him. There's songs all through the Bible. And here's the consistent pattern. The songs follow God doing something big. God reaches into a person's life, works in a powerful way in that person's life, and then they respond in songs of praise. And so the picture is that if God works in your life, the natural outflow is to sing a song of praise. That to not do it is like to kink a hose and the pressure just builds and the pressure just builds until something bursts because that's the natural response. So the first reason we sing songs of praise is because that's the natural way to do it. It's what flows naturally. Now, sometimes that's publicly, sometimes that pri privately, but it's to sing songs of praise. But here's the second reason we do it, and especially why we do it publicly. Because your song of praise may be what God uses to encourage somebody who's suffering or who's going through a trial or who is in a time of great pain. It might be that your song of praise is what God uses to encourage someone else. And to talk about the primary context many of us have which, for that, which is Sunday mornings. You have all been in settings on a Sunday morning where nobody is really singing, the energy is gone, and your mind is turning to anything else. But you're definitely not being encouraged or built up by it. And then you've been in situations where everybody's singing where every voice is being lifted up. And some of the voices are beautiful. Some of the voices are special in their own way. <laughs> but everybody's singing and the energy is up and you come out of that encouraged and energized for the work of God. And so that's the second reason we sing is because your singing may be what God uses to encourage someone else. Now here's where this can get convicting for us. It can for me, I'm guessing it can for you. It's very easy for us to come into times of singing and worship with a mindset that says, I want to get something out of it. Ooh, I like that song. I'm into it. I'm going to sing this song. I don't like that song. That song's too new. That song's too old. I'm just going to kind of like this. And the problem is when you do that, it's not just about you. It may be that your voice being silent is taking away a means God intended to use to encourage somebody else around you. 
Because God can work through the praise of his people to encourage those who are hurting. To give you an example, how many of you know the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day? Now, I know some of you are cringing right now because you're like, no, it's not even October, no Christmas talk. <laughs> this isn't Christmas talk, it's just the story. See, the author of the poem that became that song was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He wrote that song in Christmas of 1863. His wife, who he loved dearly, had died several years earlier. Her dress caught on fire. He tried to smother it and put it out. He was burned so badly, he grew a beard to cover the burns, and he lost his wife in that, which meant he was a widowed man raising five, six children on his own. Now, before that Christmas Eve, his oldest son had hopped on a train, taken a rail from Massachusetts down to Washington, D.C., and enlisted with the Union Army to fight in the Civil War. Shortly before Christmas, at a small battle, he took a bullet that went in through one shoulder and went out through the other, and the doctors weren't sure if paralysis was going to result. And so they got his oldest son back up to him, and Longfellow finds himself going into Christmas, sitting there, still grieving the loss of his wife. Six, five, six children to raise his oldest son whom he loves, not sure if he's ever going to walk again. And he starts hearing the bells ring. That's the background to when he wrote the words. And in despair, I bowed my head, hearing the bells ring. In despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You hear his discouragement there. You hear even his suffering at what was done to the hand, done to his son, in the Civil War by people in rebellion. And yet, as those bells continued to ring praise, Wadsworth would get to a place where he would say, then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will to men. Wadsworth found, encour or Longfellow, excuse me, found encouragement in the bells ringing out praise because people were cheered by what God had done so many years ago, coming to earth in the person of Jesus. And so we read in verse 13, if you're cheerful, if you've been encouraged by God, sing. Whether you like the song, whether you don't like the song, whether your voice is good, whether your voice isn't good, because as the people of God sing together, God uses that to encourage others in their time of need. So if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, sing. And then he comes to, this becomes the sticky verse. Take a look at it with me in verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. This becomes sticky because if we don't read it carefully, it sounds like anytime you are sick, go to the elders, they will pray for you, and you will get better. Except here's what we know happens. Sometimes people go to the elders. Elders are spiritual leaders of the church. We'll get into that much more in a couple of weeks as we begin the book of Titus. People go to the elders, they pray for them, and the sickness doesn't go away. And so there's a danger of falling into two responses on this. The first response is to say, well, it's because of the prayer of faith. And so if it didn't work, either the elders didn't have enough faith or the person going to them didn't have enough faith. And I've sat with people before in tears because they've left their church because there was something wrong in their lives and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they didn't get better and they saw people start to turn against them because they were saying, you must not have enough faith. So there's a danger of falling into that. But then in order to avoid that, the second danger is we start trying to make qualifications on the promise and we go, well, if it's God's will and if we're praying in alignment with God's will and if we do this, then this will happen. And we put so many qualifications on the promise that it's no longer an encouragement. But let's look at what's really going on here by beginning at looking at verse 14. Because the key word in verse 14 is the word sick. See, 18 times in the New Testament, that word is used to refer to physical ailment. What we typically think of as just sickness. But 14 times that word is used to refer to being weary in soul, to being worn out, to being weak, especially from trying to walk faithfully with Jesus and the trials and tribulations you run into leave you weak to where you're going, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can finish this race. And so how do we determine 
which usage it is. Does sick here mean physically sick or does it mean like sick and weary in soul? Well, when you come to a word that has meanings like this where it could go one way or the other, what you want to do is look at the context. Now, the rest of the book of James has been speaking to a church going through trials, suffering, who clearly are having a hard time hanging on to actually following and living the way Jesus would call them to do. And so in light of that context, we could read it as all of a sudden he just shifts gears and he starts talking to people with medical ailments. But it makes much, much better sense that sick here doesn't mean sick physically, but it means weary in soul. It means weak. It means you have been trying to walk with Jesus and you've gotten beaten up for it and you're not sure that you can keep going. The very thorough Bible teacher, John MacArthur, he puts it like this about this word. He says the weak, and that's the word sick. He translates that, that word weak. So the weak or sick are those who have been defeated in spiritual battle, who have lost the ability to endure their suffering. They, have, they are fallen spiritual warriors, the exhausted, weary, depressed, defeated Christians. We all relate to that, don't we? Of hitting that point where it feels like going on with this thing, living faithfully to this thing. Man, I'm weary and I'm weak. When you know faithfully living to follow Jesus is going to get you labeled as some kind of homophobic, Islamophobic, transphobic, hateful, bigoted, narrow-minded. And then you think of going into work the next day and not burying your faith, but actually living it and trying to minister to people. You can grow weary in the midst of that. When you know it's going to get you labeled as unpatriotic or un-American, or it's going to bring those looks that you can grow weary in that. When you are trying to serve and love people who you know are looking to take advantage of you and who aren't looking to serve or love you back, you can grow weary in that. Megan and I one time knew a woman. She was an awesome, awesome woman. She was probably in her, probably in her 70s at this point. She worked with the city government trying to help people in low-income situations find housing. She volunteered serving food at a ministry for people who were homeless. And then on top of that, she'd go out of her way to reach out to widows who had nobody else. And so this woman sounds like a saint. I know. She was awesome. She was also the one who would sugar up the kids as much as humanly possible on Sunday morning and then send them back to their parents. So, see, everybody has a fault. This woman was incredible in her desire to serve out of her love for Christ. She was so weary in the midst of it because she was working with so many people who were challenging. She was trying to love so many people who couldn't return any kind of care and who would often take advantage of her. And so her greatest struggle was in serving those people, not to snap and lash out at them in anger or to turn against them because she was growing weary from trying to be faithful. And so when it says, is anyone among you sick? That's what it's talking about. Those of us who are weary in the work, those of us who are weary under the weight of trying to live the Christian faith, those of you who are weary because doubts and questions have settled over you and you're not sure if you can keep going. He says to those people, let him call for the elders of the church, the spiritual leaders, and let them pray over that person, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now let's deal with the oil and then the pray over. In this day and age, oil was something used when people were physically sore. If you were to say, go into the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament and read the story of the Good Samaritan, after a man is beaten and robbed, one who cares for him treats him by using oil. You'd rub it into sore muscles to help with the pain. And so most likely what's happening here is this is the leaders of these local churches trying to care for people as best they can, trying to help them with the pain. And we still today, our elders, if people come to us, will anoint them with oil, we'll put oil on their heads as a symbol of this is how you are cared for, that we love you, that we want to care for you and look after you. And so that's what's going on with the oil. But 14 is amazing because it's saying if that's happening to you, if you're weary and in danger of drifting away, go seek out spiritual leaders who are going to pray for you. Here's why that's amazing. Because in times of weariness and in times of weakness, our default is not to draw closer. Our default is to pull away. 
I've lived through that myself in college. When I grew weary because of the, what had happened is I had a great group of friends in college who were Christians. I was new to following Jesus. That had just happened like a year and a half ago. But then all those friends started to get married. Some of them started to transfer different things. And all of a sudden that friend group was gone. The pastors at the church I were at got reassigned, and so they were at different places, and I ended up drifting from my church, and all of a sudden I had nobody, I had these questions, I had these doubts, and so I just started pulling back and pulling back and pulling back. And what I found is what I was doing was backing into one of the worst periods of sin in my life, and one of the most painful periods in my life too. See, I, I will look back at middle school. So those of you in here who are in middle school, I'll look back at middle school and be like, there were some tough parts, but there were some really cool parts about middle school. And I'll look back at high school, and I know some of you are like, I hate high school. I'll look back at high school, and be like, high school was all right. And then I look at college. You know, I'd grown up, I had family telling me, college are the best years of your life. I hate looking back at my college years. Hate them. Because as I pulled back, I fell into sin, and that brought all kinds of pain into my life. And so what God is saying here is, if you're under that weariness, don't pull back. Go closer. Move even closer. Go to the leaders and say, I need you to pray for me because I'm too weak to do it and I need you to help sustain me. And God's promise here in this, he says, the prayer of faith, that's the prayer of the leaders. You might be struggling in your faith, but those leaders have faith. They pray in faith. will save, will rescue you out of that. The one who is sick, who is weak and weary, and the Lord will raise him up. He'll raise you up out of that despair, out of that weakness. Maybe it'll be immediate. Maybe it will take time. But as you go to those leaders and they pray, they will, those prayers, God will work through those to raise you up. And if he has committed sins, because sins drive people apart, if he's committed sins, they'll be forgiven. That's not ultimate forgiven by God. That's forgiven so you can be reintegrated into the community. And so God's word here, it's challenging, but it's this promise that says, if you are weak and weary, don't pull further back. Draw further in. Because it's as you draw further in that he is going to sustain you. You know, to put a picture to it, when lions hunt wildebeest, they don't hunt the strong, healthy ones in the middle of the herd. They go after the weak and sick ones trailing at the back. If one of those wildebeest wants to survive, it doesn't pull further away from the herd. It draws deeper into the center where the strength of those around it can sustain it. What James, what God is saying through James in verses 14 and 15 is to do the same. When you are weak and weary, draw deeper in to the people of God so that the strength of those around you will sustain you. But then he makes kind of this weird turn because he's talked about Sin, And then it says in 16, Therefore confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And there's some who read that and they go, well, clearly what's happening is in that day they thought sin always resulted in sickness. So they're assuming if these people are, are weary or are struggling, it must be because they sinned. Those people have no respect for, that, that's a bad way to say it. Let me put it this way instead. James's brother Jesus explicitly taught that not all sickness was related to sin. The whole book of James has been a commentary on the life of Jesus. I don't think at the last minute James forgot something that Jesus taught. So this isn't teaching that sin is causing sickness, is causing this weariness. No, here's what's happening. God is sharing with us something that we've learned experientially, and it's this. Sin often grows in the shadow of weariness. Sin often grows in the shadow of weariness. And so if somebody has been going through, if you've been going through a period where you've been weary, it's easy in those times for sin to start to take root. That's what happened in my life. And he's saying, here's how you deal with that. Not just if you've grown weary, but you've fallen in to sin and you have sin destroying your life, eating away at you, eating away at your relationships. He says, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another. The word confess, literally, if you break it apart, means same word. I mean, saying, you know what, this thing that I'm doing, this thing that I'm not doing, God has called it sin. God has said it's going to be destructive to me and those around me. And I am agreeing with God. We're very good justifiers. We're very good at being able to say, well, God said this is, is sin, but when I'm doing it, it's not that, it's this, and that's okay. To confess is to say, no, I'm agreeing with God. That's what this is, and this, this is an issue. This is sin. And so you can... Confess that and then you pray.
pray for one another. And that sounds so scary. You're, you're asking somebody to pray for you in that sin, but it's another example of not pulling further away, but going deeper in. And see, God is saying this because we've all lived experientially. We know that sin often grows in the shadow of weariness, but strength is often found in the light of community. Sin might grow in the shadow of weariness, but strength is often found in the light of community. And so what God is doing is calling you to take your weariness, your suffering, even your sin into the light of community so that you might find strength in those places. And he makes this point that there's great power in those prayers that people will offer for you. And he tells this story in verses 17 through 18 about Elijah. To sum that up very quickly, Elijah play, prayed for a time when the nation of Israel was experiencing extreme drought because of their sin and in response to their prayer, God brought rain. Here's the picture to take from that. The people of Israel were experiencing great drought. A faithful person prayed fervently for them and through that, God brought refreshment. If you're in a time of great drought where you're going, I need refreshment, let me ask, who are you asking to pray for you? Because it may be that God works through their prayers to bring refreshment for you. Then after these instructions on prayers, God gives us something for if somebody hasn't just experienced weariness, it's not just you're weary and you've fallen into sin, but what if somebody's just plain wandered away? For in verse 19, it says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, verse 20, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, the first key word here is wander. The word translated wander is the word from which we get the, the, the English word planet. Because see, when the ancients would look at the stars and the stars would take their normal paths, it would seem like the planets were just sort of meandering about, strolling around. You know, my wife doesn't let me drive when we go downtown in new cities because I start looking around at all the scenery and I get lost and just start taking random turns. And that's the picture of what's happening here. It's not somebody who stood up and gone, I'm over this Jesus thing and I'm out. It's somebody who just bit by bit by bit has kind of wandered away from where God would have them be. And James says, if you know somebody like that and they wander from the truth and, and you bring him back, what you're doing, that... That will cover a multitude of sins. Here's what he's saying. Just because somebody's wandered doesn't mean somebody's lost. Just because somebody's wandered doesn't mean somebody's lost. It's not, well, you were walking with Jesus and you've wandered away and now no more for you, you're gone. He's saying, no, bring them back, seek them out because it may be that God uses that to once again bring them to him where he can minister peace and joy and righteousness to them. And that raises the question, how do we do that? Because some of you are thinking of people right now. I know I am. Some of you are thinking of people. Now, some of you may be those people. I, I've been that people, that, that people. I've been that person. But some of you are thinking, how do I do that? Well, the text doesn't say this explicitly. Let me just give what may be three kind of wise ways to approach it. And the first one, listen attentively. Listen attentively. You should see it up here. But the first way we do this, listen attentively. We may not have them up here. That's okay. Listen attentively because what you want to do is you just want to hear out where that person is coming from, what's going on in their lives. Don't bring your assumptions. Seek to hear their story. So you listen attentively. You also pray fervently or listen patiently. Excuse me. You also pray fervently. Pray fervently for opportunities to hear them. Pray fervently for opportunities to share with them. Just pray fervently, God, if you can use me, use me to do this. And then finally, speak honestly. This is the hard one. This is the hard one. And often it's because we're going, this person's already drifted. I don't want to drive them any further away. Speak honestly, because here's what I found. Here's what you've probably found too. I can look back on my life in those times when I wandered. And there are a handful of men and women I look back on and I go, I am so grateful for them because God used them to bring me back to himself. And as I look at those people, Every single one of them spoke honestly to me. I was afraid of every single one of them at some point. 
I, didn't, I was mad at every single one of them at some point because they spoke honestly to me. And yet they are the people who still today I take time to write cards to and say, thank you for what you have meant in my life because this is what God did through you. And see, what we know is this, that when we look back, it's the people who spoke honestly who we honor. It's the people who spoke honestly in your life who you look back on and honor. And so if God is going to use you to bring someone back, how do you do that? One of the big ways, speak honestly and trust God to work with it. And so God gives us that as his final word. He gives, how do you sustain each other through times where you may be weary, through times where you may be suffering? God gives that as his final word because in it we don't just see instructions for what to do, we see God's heart towards us. We see that God's heart as he came in the person of Jesus, as he was willing to lay down his life to rescue people who at that time did not want to return his love, we see his heart is not just to save people, but it's to sustain people. We won't necessarily do, but if we turn to John chapter 17, verses 14 through 15, we'd see Jesus as he's going to the cross, as he's preparing to suffer, praying for you and for I, saying, God, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I don't ask that you take them out, but keep them from the evil one. Before he died, Jesus prayed for those who would have faith in him. If you have faith in Jesus, he prayed for you. Still today, he's praying for you. Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who did, is interceding, is praying for us. Jesus has prayed for you. Jesus is praying for you to be sustained, and he will sustain you. You know, years ago in England, William Wilberforce was working to end the British slave trade and to end slavery in the English Empire. And he labored at it for year after year after year, unable to make the advances he wanted to make in Parliament, unable to change the law he wanted to, and he was growing weary in it. And in the midst of that, he opened his Bible, for Wilberforce was a committed Christian man, and a note fell out of it. And it was a note from John Wesley that had been written to Wilberforce years before. He picked it up and opened it, and here's what Wesley wrote. Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go in the name of God and in the power of his might. And in this, Wilberforce found the encouragement he needed to continue on until he completed the work of ending the English slave trade from this letter of encouragement. And if your faith is in Christ, then what we see here in these final words is God's desire is to encourage and sustain you through any hardship you're in or may come to that he has for you a letter like this one to sustain you. Wilberforce has fell out of his Bible, but what we see at the end of James is this. Jesus' letter of encouragement is delivered through his people. Jesus' letter of encouragement is delivered through his people. If you are in a time of suffering right now, if you are in a time of being weary, we're going to give you an opportunity to act on this prayer. See, the worship team is going to come up now. But we're going to have a couple of our elders go to, it's called the fireside room. If you go out the back and just go to the first room out there, you're going to see it there. We're going to have them in there. If you're in a place of weariness, if you're in a place of suffering, I want to invite you, you can go there, you can pray with them now. Or if you're not ready to pray now, you can reach out to the email address, the email address on the bulletin and say, I need people to pray with me. And we will arrange for people to pray with you. If you need to just pray silently, our team is going to be leading, not the closing song, but just some music, and you're going to have an opportunity to sit and pray silently. Or if you need to pray with someone else, and I know this is going to be challenging, I'm going to invite you to turn to someone you're sitting by if you need and say, hey, will you pray for me for this? And you're going to have somebody else pray for you that you might find God sustaining you in that. If you've never placed your faith in Christ, and you want to, this is a chance for you to pray and call out to God and say, I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to be weary. I want you sustaining me. 
Show me how you're going to do it. Show me that. Sustain me now. Give me peace and joy and righteousness. Call out to God and let him minister to you and see that Jesus will come through for you. And then after that, we're going to stand together and sing. And if you're cheerful and doing well, you're going to have an opportunity to raise your voice in praise as an encouragement to those around you. And so I'm going to begin us in a time of prayer. The team is going to pray. If you need to go pray with the elders, go pray with the elders. If you need to pray with someone next to you, pray with someone next to you. If you need to pray sitting there, pray sitting there as we prepare to stand and those who are cheerful to raise voices in praise. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the midst of our suffering. We come to you in the midst of our weariness. We come to you in the midst of our weakness. For sometimes the loads that we pick up in life are more than what we are able to carry. And so we call out now. Some of us call out silently. Some of us gather together to pray. Some of us go and pray with the elders as instructed. But we pray to you, O Lord, to sustain us. We pray that you would deliver messages of encouragement as we pray together. So at this time, we pause to listen to you, to pray silently, to pray together. Lord, as we lift our prayers and seek your encouragement through them, we also who are cheerful, who have been encouraged by you, who have seen you work mightily in our lives, we stand to join together to sing your praises. I ask that you be honored by it and that any suffering or weak would be encouraged by them. Amen.